This episode of Epicenter is brought to you by Jax. Jax is the user-friendly wallet that works across all your devices and handles both Bitcoin and Ether. Go to jax.io and embrace the future of cryptocurrency wallets. And by the Ledger Nano S, the hardware wallet which sets the new standard in security and usability. Get it today at ledgerwallet.com and use the offer code EPICENTER to get 10% off your order. Welcome to Epicenter, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and startups driving decentralization and the global blockchain revolution. My name is Brian Fabian Crane. And I'm Meher Roy. Today we have a very distinguished guest on our show. Uh, he's Brian Balendorf. He has had a long career in the software industry and is associated with so many projects that I'm sure you must have heard about. And so I'm going to walk through like... Uh, a list of his achievements and positions that he holds. And then we are going to start talking about his current involvement in the Hyperledger project. So Brian Brian was uh, is probably best known as the co-founder of the Apache Software Foundation and is currently the chairman of the board of directors at the Electronic Frontier Foundation, EFF. He's also on the board of directors for Mozilla and Benetech. And his major occupation right now is as executive director of Hyperledger at the Linux Foundation. So we are going to talk mostly, we are going to focus this show mostly on what Hyperledger is and what is what it does. But perhaps before we start uh, talking about Hyperledger, we could have um, like a small intro from, from Brian himself in his own words. And uh, perhaps the story of how he got to be involved in the blockchain industry. Thanks. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. So it is a very long and winding road that I've taken uh, to get here from uh, starting uh, being a co-founder of the Apache Software Foundation and uh, very early days of the, uh, the web. But in a way, it kind of feels like the web in 1994 all over again. Um, so let me r roll through what I what I've done the last couple of years. Um, I was you know spent most of my time. I have spent most of my time in San Francisco. I've lived here since 1991 when I started as a freshman at um, University of California Berkeley, and then um, got involved with uh, the early days of the web, Wired Magazine, building websites, starting Apache. Um, started a company called Collabnet. Left that in 2007, and then worked for. Uh, the Obama campaign in 2008, and then worked at the White House for two years, 2009 and 2010, working on open data policy, open government policy, and open source software, actually, as a way to move forward certain, certain policy objectives, particularly in healthcare. Um, and then went to go work as chief technology officer for the World Economic Forum, where I got to see, to some degree, how world policy is made, how uh, uh, minds are changed, uh, how projects are put together, uh, and both what's possible and what's really hard about doing that at scale. Um, and built a lot of friendships, a lot of relationships inside the tech space, but, but also well beyond. Um, and then uh, left there, came back. I started to get homesick because I was living in D.C. and then Geneva. I came home to San Francisco. Wasn't quite sure what I wanted to do, so I had the opportunity to join as a managing director at a venture capital fund called Mithril. Um, and so it started there in 2013. Uh, and in addition to looking at companies involved in everything from nuclear fusion to uh, solving diabetes to, you know, all sorts of different kinds of technology, well beyond, obviously, Internet and information technology, um, we started to see a lot of different companies pitching us on Bitcoin and blockchain related ideas, right? And I started to actually get pretty skeptical about um, a lot of what I saw. I mean, add the ordinary skepticism about Bitcoin, right? Uh, uh, and I think there's interesting stuff going on there, but there's a lot of it that at its root was kind of about currency speculation. Um, but there is also something very intriguing about this idea of the global ledger. Even from 2008, when I read all of the hype around Satoshi Nakamoto's paper, uh, this idea of being able to have a single large global ledger of all of the tokens in circulation and who owned them and, um, and keeping track of when they were transferred in a way that prevented somebody from being able to spend the same coin twice, that was really fascinating to me, right? And so I didn't pay attention to Bitcoin much in 2008 when you could have mined you know, a few BTC a day on your laptop. 
But as these companies were talking to us, you know, I realized it was more than just about currency. It was also about uh, being able to change a lot of how the systems of the world worked. So bringing what I learned from the World Economic Forum, bringing what I learned from, from my time in D.C., uh, I started to really pay attention to use cases involving things like uh, tracking the diamond trade and the supply chain in the diamond industry to try to keep blood diamonds out of circulation or reforming how land title registration might work in a developing country in order to uh, not only make it easier for people to record you know, selling a house from one person to another, but also keeping corrupt bureaucrats from being able to steal land uh, from people, right? Simply because once it's digital, it's very easy to um, you know, corrupt the, uh, and, and eliminate the paper trail unless you have a public ledger, a public record of what's being built. So for me, the idea of blockchain built on top of all of my passion for open source and open data and trying to see if there are technology tools to reform some of the really deep structural social problems out there in the world. Um, and so I'd listen very closely to these blockchain companies um, and I would get frustrated because they would want to raise really large amounts of money, especially for such an early technology and such an early industry. And we'd ask them what they plan to spend that money on. And while they talked about all these amazing, you know, high level use cases and ideas, they were going to spend the money on plumbing, right? They were going to spend the money on whether it was a fork of Bitcoin or a fork of Ethereum or something way down here with the idea that they would be, even in a decentralized ledger, they could be the gateway or they could be the, the, the you know, everyone would say Red Hat, but I think in their mind, they really wanted to be the Google of this space They're the, or the Amazon Web Services of this space, right? The, the one default that everybody turned to and had to turn to um, because they just did it faster, better, cheaper than everyone else. Intriguing at one level, but I also felt like that was very different than both the decentralized nature of distributed ledgers, um, and also how internet technologies really succeed, right? Which is people, companies working together, startups and large companies on common plumbing, on common infrastructure, and then uh, building on top and going into truly differentiate, differentiated areas. Like I would rather have invested while I was still at this firm in uh, you know, a company using blockchain, building blockchain-based applications for a very specific sector like healthcare or supply chain, but building on top of plumbing that already existed, or for which maybe they were one-tenth of the total needed in order to build that plumbing rather than building all their own plumbing. So, so I got frustrated at this and, and you know, looked around at kind of how the community was trying to address this. And the Bitcoin community was still very much coming from a payments centric point of view. The Ethereum community was really focused on building the decentralized Airbnb and the decentralized Uber. And I have a lot of resonance for that model. I mean, I, I like the payments idea too. I, certainly there's a lot of disruption and decentralization that has to go on in that industry. But I also felt like internet technologies and even the web were successful because they allowed, you know, while we had our wild-eyed advocates, we had our Richard Stallmans and our John Perry Barlows, and we had you know, these, these, these long-term visions of where we wanted to get to, we got there by bringing the systems of the world along with us and, and you know, kind of going through a phase change where we could turn these information systems into decentralized information systems uh, and gradually kind of get ourselves inside and then, and then we can be disruptive and take over. Um, and so when Hyperledger launched, um, I certainly paid attention. I first heard about it uh, December 17th of last year was when the first announcement went out. Uh, and, uh, and so I started tracking it, learning more about it, uh, listening in on the, um, the, the technical steering committee calls and following the mailing lists. And then I went to um, the consensus conference and at that point said, okay, there's something I could tell by the lack of something like the Linux Foundation and, and Hyperledger that there was a need for it. I mean, I, um, and I had been talking at that point with Jim Zemlin, who is the executive director of the Linux Foundation. I've known him for a very long time. Um, and uh, I think he's been eager for me to find a way to work for him at, <laughs> at some point anyways. Um, so, uh, I, you know, he said we could use some help here. And I said, OK, sign me up. And we figured out a way to make it, make it work. Uh, and so I joined Hyperledger um, officially in June of this year.
Cool. Well, that, that is a very comprehensive uh, sort of story of how we got there. Now, you've been involved in the, these early web technologies and since the very beginning, and there was a lot of idealism, I think, around that, right? I mean, also with the EFF that you're part of, there is, uh, has always been this idea of the internet being a place of freedom, of open expression. What is your view about the state of the internet today? And what do you think is the relevance for blockchain for the state of the internet uh, in the longer term? I find myself going back and rereading um, John Perry Barlow's Declaration of the Independence of Cyberspace uh, quite often now. Um, uh, it was written in 96. He actually delivered it at the World Economic Forum uh, meeting. Uh, and it was a very strong statement that what we're building on the internet is this sovereign independent space where governments were not even welcome. Uh, and that's I strongly resonated with that when it came out. I, I, I still resonate with it quite a bit. Uh, and I think what we've discovered is, you know, when all of us get on board, we bring our government with us, right? Um, we bring our, our systems of uh, our value systems, our priorities, our passions, our differences. I mean, you certainly see this in the last, the events of the last few weeks, you know, where so much passion was poured into a really bitter fight. Um, and yet, as an American society, at least, we're farther apart than ever, right? Um, and, and that's been, a, been a, 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 a rude awakening in a way. And um, I've always believed that progress has been made by a combination of revolutionaries and evolutionaries. And so uh, I find myself resonating quite a bit with people who want to find a way to re-decentralize the web. I think the internet and the web today has, at a certain level, grown over-centralized for sure. I um, mean, here we are recording this on Google. Most people have a Gmail account. Uh, so much of our lives is dependent upon a couple of uh, very few providers. And that is, you know, not only economically, that means a lot of the rewards go to a few, uh, a few organizations in the whole ecosystem. It also is not resilient, right? What happens if Twitter runs out of money and goes out of business? Suddenly an entire channel of communication is cut off because there isn't really a great alternative. And others may step in, but that's, that's fragile. And so I'm, I'm really worked up about figuring out how do we focus on anti-fragility, right? Uh, and for me, blockchains are, are a big part of that. Um, whether that's happening at a global scale, like the Ethereum and Bitcoin networks, or whether that happens at a very local scale, getting a small group of nonprofits or, or banks or you know, political organizations to be able to have a shared ledger, public or private, but governed by its own sense of governance um, in the way that we have overlapping networks today that collectively we build into something called the internet. You mentioned before that when you went to consensus, you saw that because there wasn't something like Hyperledger that was missing. So what exactly did you see there? Uh, what kind of unmet needs that you felt Hyperledger would fill? So there wasn't really a, um, an open source community that I felt embodied what we saw at the Apache Software Foundation. So the part that I'm proudest of at the, at the ASF was launching, and, and certainly there are a lot of people who helped uh, refine this and build it. It wasn't just me, but, but certainly at the beginning, there was this sense that the community is what comes first. And you have to get the dynamics right. You have to make the project a multi-vendor project, you know, a multi-stakeholder project. You have to have a way to bring new developers into the core. You have to give a way for core developers to exit, otherwise they burn out, right? Um, you have to have some feedback loop with the, with the public um, and, and also some way, some effective governance around the open source project itself. And the ASF, I think, has served uh, very well for this. Uh, there's now 300 different projects under Apache. The focus there is on community over code. Um, you, you, if you have a healthy community, good software is practically a natural byproduct. Um, and, uh, and so that's, that's the DNA to get right. That's what I'm trying to spend more time now focusing on than anything else. Um, I also felt like, um, and this is uh, you know, something we may touch on uh, later in this, in this conversation, but that there was really a need to separate out the, the governance and the process of writing software and, and the governance and process of managing standards. And then thirdly, the, the governance and process of managing a global consensus, right? 
So you can very much think of this as the difference between Apache building a web server, the Internet Engineering Task Force built de deciding on HTTP standards, and uh, ICANN, let's say, um, do, or, the, or the CA browser forum, let's use a more direct example, managing the global certificate hierarchy uh, for um, for the top level uh, for the top level certificate authorities that we all um, preload into our browsers and servers, right? Um, all of these are three different. These are three different functions that the cryptocurrency community was combining into one, and I think they had to to bootstrap, but that was causing tensions, and that was causing tensions between the interests of the miners, the interests of the people writing, uh, you know, smart contracts, uh, uh, and and the interests of people holding holding tokens. And the interests of the companies trying to build businesses on top of these platforms. Uh, that tension was not being resolved when you had all three of these different functions uh, happening in the same broad community. Um, uh, so that, that was something that I felt you know, was something that both the Linux Foundation had figured out how to bring to Linux. The Apache Software Foundation, I think, had figured out how to bring uh, to its projects. And um, you know, it, it and with Hyperledger starting, it made sense to to take advantage of the the companies now interested in in moving the ball forward with this as a focus. Let's take a short break to talk about Jax. Jax is a multi-coin wallet created by the people at the central. Now, in the past, if you had a whole bunch of cryptocurrencies, it was a pain to handle them. You either had to leave them on an exchange, which was insecure or you had to have all these different wallets, which was a hassle. Fortunately, now with Jax, those medieval days of darkness, misery, and suffering are over. Jax supports multiple cryptocurrencies and new ones are being added. But it's not just storing cryptocurrencies you can do with Jax, but you can also exchange them directly from within inside the wallet thanks to their Shapeshift integration. And since there's only one seed, Jax makes it super easy to back up and sync to your other devices. Jax works with Windows, Mac OS, Linux, Android, iOS, and has browser extensions for Firefox and Chrome. So go to jax.io, that's J A X X.io, to download the wallet and get started today. We'd like to thank Jax for their support of Epicenter. So uh, before we go on, so like many of our listeners and including me we are we are very well versed with the governance problem of the of the cryptocurrency area yeah? because like we we follow it and we see that this is a system that has all of these different stakeholders like miners and developers and companies and in like individual holders and sometimes they are at, at odds with each other and this has repeated across all of the projects that 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 we have followed but can you give an example of uh, what kind of divergent interests exist for a body like the Linux Foundation or the Apache Software Foundation? Like, like you say, you're saying that this is in some way analogous, right? So I'm just trying to ask the question, like what kind of conflicts or what kinds of uh, divergent interests exist in the world that you are familiar with and that your background is from? Well, um, so uh, uh, divergent interests at the Linux Foundation include everything from, you know, uh, Microsoft starting out its experience with Linux, calling it a cancer upon the uh, the software operating a uh, software world in two thousand and one, two thousand and two, I think, when they were starting to to actually acknowledge the existence of open source. Um, uh, to now in twenty in twenty sixteen, joining the Linux Foundation as a platinum member. Um, uh, that's a perhaps a long-term sea change um, uh, on on Microsoft's side, but uh, um, certainly and certainly they are uh, uh, late to the party in some way. I mean, um, we've had other large companies, other major technology companies, as a part of the Linux Foundation for a long time, and yet, where does most of the energy come from and innovation come from in Linux? It probably comes from the people who are. Um, working on it uh, with because they have a bright idea for a new kind of file system, or they have a, an idea for a different way to, you know, scale it down to something the size of a Raspberry Pi Zero, um, or they're working on a supercomputing cluster, you know, and they need to make it work there. It runs on 496, I think, of the 500 largest uh, computers in the world, right? Um, and so, uh, and much of that is corporate funded. I mean, IBM and Intel and HP and all these other companies are certainly doing their bit to invest into Linux. And so the Linux Foundation has had to kind of be a, a balancing act between all these corporates and do that in a way that doesn't disturb uh, 
what makes open source projects actually effective, which is getting developers together in a room and talking objectively about what do we want to build? What's the right way to build it? How do we, you know, measure and quantify and put our egos aside, right? Uh, and, and talk about how to actually converge on a common body of code. Um, and sometimes that's by allowing, you know, 20 different file, uh, file systems <laughs> to coexist inside the Linux kernel, knowing that over time, one or two of them will actually settle out and become, you know, the predominant ones, right? And so that was, that's a culture of, uh, that we're adopting at Hyperledger, right? The idea is let's allow the architecture to organically emerge over time. Let's not, you know, put too much hero worship into one, one architect or one developer who has to carry the burden of the entire project on their shoulders and say, here is the right way top down to build something. Let's let this be organic. Let's have a couple of different distributed ledger technologies. Let's have a couple of different smart contract engines. Let's look and see, are there zero knowledge proof engines out there that might be you know, interesting to add on top of this um, and might even compete? Competition isn't bad. Let's, you know, if we're all under the same license, if we're all pulling for the same team globally, right? Then um, I can borrow good ideas and code from your project, you can borrow it from mine, and we can let Darwin kind of tell us which of these ideas ultimately are better or not. And so, um, so I, th I think balancing that tension, making sure that developers are at the heart of setting the priorities, setting the process, um, uh, but that we're also responding to the public in some way. That's, that's a balancing act, that's an art form, and that's something that, that we're hoping to do at, uh, at Hyperledger. So if you think about the longer term, and, and if you look at the blockchain space, what kind of, you know, let's assume Hyperledger turns out to be a great success. It, it really kind of accomplishes any of, of the things you would like it to accomplish. What kind of impact will that have on the community? And what do you think could happen on the negative side if nobody does this work, right? If neither Hyperledger succeed, nobody else steps up. Right. Um, well, certainly the scenario that I saw emerging at the beginning of this year, 2016, that caused me to wake up and go, can I, can I help with this, is the sense that there is this constant churn at the lower levels of the, the technology and constant debates that were very, very kind of ego-driven and also very much driven by the tokens that one perhaps had in one's pocket, you know, um, that can often color one's technical opinions um, unavoidably, right? Uh, and, and that kind of poisonous atmosphere, I felt, was, was forcing us to spend all of our time in the plumbing and none of our time, actually, or very little of our time, um, solving some of the big problems that we could solve. I mean, I don't get up in the morning thinking about, you know, can we come up with a new consensus mechanism today? Um, or can I squeeze out another, you know, 20% transactions per second? I mean, those are, those are interesting questions. Those are useful questions. I get up thinking about, can we, can we apply this technology to um, uh, improving the food supply chain, right? So that when bad food gets into the systems, we know where it goes. Can we use this to give identities to refugees, right? Um, uh, get granted by nonprofit organizations serving them rather than having to depend upon a central government to issue an ID, right? These are things that if we could spend less time thinking about plumbing and more time about applications, we can get there further and faster. Um, and so that's, that was that the, the success story for me would be every good idea about how to do a consensus mechanism, how to do a smart contract is given an opportunity to flourish, to find collaborators and to move as quickly as possible from a good idea to production quality code. So we can see how does this really compare with the others, right? Um, uh, and failure is one where those good ideas don't even get a chance because we're debating how large the block size should be on one one single chain, right? Um, that's 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 what drives me. Today's magic word is Apache. That's A P A C H E. Head over to letstalkbitcoin.com to sign in, enter the magic word, and claim your part of the listener reward. So uh, one of the one of the interesting stories from my own life is uh, so in, in in Switzerland I'm based out of Switzerland and uh, uh, I along with with a few few folk uh, we we give workshops on on blockchain technology so if somebody wants you know some form of education on it we go and deliver it to them and we were at the Cybos conference this year and you know like people were coming up to us and 
requesting us different kinds of workshops and like one of the most common requests i was getting was we want a workshop on hyperledger and i was like okay fine i had heard of hyperledger i had not studied what hyperledger was and i was like okay this will be like a technology like you know ethereum that probably we could learn and we could deliver it technically and then i had a conversation with brian crane uh, and he said like but you know hyperledger isn't a blockchain or it isn't a blockchain design and i was like wow i didn't know that so if it is, isn't a blockchain design then what is it <laughs> and then i kind of look through like like your stuff and like like hyperledger is doing something that is totally unique right it it's 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 not it's 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 doing something that cannot be really fit into a category that the others can like for example you see many companies they're probably building a blockchain platform you see other companies they're building a blockchain application like hyperledger is kind of it defies all of the other categories and it's is its own unique thing right so perhaps like you could just tell us about the internal structure of hyperledger right like what does it consist of who are the people what are the projects etc Sure, and I'm I'm sure it's tough, partly because um, you know uh, Hyperledger is a name for the community, and we have many different projects underneath, and so uh, very much like Apache, right? Um, I would have totally envisioned training uh, becoming something you could do. Uh, in fact, we should talk because uh, we get the same request um, for for some of the specific projects, like training on Fabric or training on Sawtooth Lake, that sort of thing. Um, but to to give a broader picture of it. Um, so, uh, so there are multiple projects underneath the Hyperledger banner, right? Underneath the umbrella is kind of the, the metaphor that I've been using. Um, each of these projects um, is very much like an Apache project. It has a specific mission. It has a named set of developers who are called the maintainers, right? Um, and those developers should be looking to bring in new maintainers over time so that there's a healthy kind of growth in that, in that responsible group. Um, they set their own agenda, their own roadmap, their own priorities. They decide when they want to make a release. I, I, they, and they uh, so there's a couple of things, though, that we try to encourage uh, in common, right? So everybody must be under the same license, the Apache license. And we can talk about that in a bit if you want to get my, my perspectives on why that's, that's, that's the appropriate thing. Um, everyone has to use roughly the same naming convention for their packages. If you call it 0 0.9 or 1.0, um, uh, or, an, or a beta, that sort of thing. We actually have a nomenclature for how that works. Um, I, we, uh, you know, every project needs its own individual name and it needs to be fairly distinct. So Hyperledger Fabric, Sawtooth Lake. Um, but they also need, as communities, they need to be paying attention to each other and looking for opportunities to plug together um, and potentially even opportunities to merge efforts. So this is perhaps where we're different from Apache. Apache doesn't really care what the, what the code bases do at all, right? Um, they don't care if they ever converge. They don't care if there's ever only five users of a project, right? That's fine. And to a certain degree, I agree with that. And there may be room inside of Hyperledger for a five-user project um, at some point. Um, but what we're, I think, trying to do is encourage uh, these projects and say, competition is great, but let's see if there's places you can integrate and... If one of you feels like your unique you know, consensus mechanism actually makes sense as a pluggable option in Fabric or uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, the three of you are working on a smart contract engine that really could be condensed into one, um, that, that they're encouraged to do that. Not as a top-down imposition, but as a bottoms-up encouragement. Right? Um, and I think that's the way that over time we'll actually get to a very um, a smaller number of uh, standardized architectures, right? So there may be in the long term multiple d DLT engines, uh, distributed ledger uh, uh, engines inside of uh, Hyperledger, right? Um, I don't believe in the kind of the the uh, Highlander. There can be only one kind of like battle to the death. Um, <laughs> for the same reason that say in the database world we have MySQL and we have Cassandra, right? Because uh, they're very different architectures, they make very different promises to the layer above them, uh, and um, you know, and that means you know, down to their core, they are very different uh, kinds of kinds of databases. So um, I'm completely open to the idea that diversity is something that 
is is something we need in order to 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 move fast to to try out new ideas and to actually build the highest quality software. It does make it very hard to explain to the outside world when everybody has like a sports analogy metaphor in their mind when it comes to technology, you know, who is the one? Who is the winner, right? If we can get people to see that it's you know, no matter how it wins or how you put together that if you're combining hyperledger code together then you can have some guarantee of, of you know, the trustworthiness of the code, certainly the legal status of the code, um, certainly the fact that bugs can get fixed, you know, all of the kinds of things that actually matter when it comes to building software. So Brian, what is, what is kind of the, the deal and the offer there? And you know, what, what, why do companies and organizations join Hyperledger? You know, what, what are their incentives and in what ways do they contribute to the project? Right. That's a good question. So, um, so the Linux Foundation is a consortium, right? Very different than the Apache Software Foundation, which is what in the States we call a 501c3 nonprofit, which is a public charity. It's membership-based. It's kind of like the Sierra Club or, or maybe a union, right? Um, uh, instead, uh, the Linux Foundation is more of a traditional industrial consortium. Looks like, you know, uh, there are a lot of standards bodies that are also in this mode. Um, and what it means is that our work is funded by um, companies who are members, both of the Linux Foundation and then of the individual projects at the Linux Foundation. So it might seem strange that Linux is doing something in the blockchain space, but um, li the Linux Foundation has actually gone beyond um, the Linux operating system into, a, into 30 different projects that are all kind of related, it's all still something you'd consider plumbing, right? Whether it's Cloud Foundry and the Cloud Native Computing Foundation or, or Open Daylight with Software Defined Networking, um, all of these different efforts are still fundamentally about getting industry who benefits tremendously from open source uh, to pony up <laughs> and uh, actually commit the resources to um, facilitating these projects. And now there are plenty of open source projects that obviously operate out there without uh, funding involved in, in ways you know, that, that the Linux Foundation does. And I have a lot of respect for them. Um, Apache, for example, while there are some corporate sponsors, uh, Apache has no full-time staff. Uh, they do pay contractors for systems administration to maintain their systems um, and, the, and for PR resources as well and a few other things, some legal advice, that sort of thing. Um, uh, and, and, but they don't pay in a full-time executive director. They have a full-time executive assistant, actually, a secretary, but not an um, executive director. And that's fine. That can work. But that volunteerism also comes at a price. It means that the people who can afford to do that kind of work um, are those uh, you know, you know, who have been able to get to a position with their jobs that allows them to work full-time on things like this, which... Um, you know, is, is rare, you know, uh, and there's very few companies in the world that actually allow their employees to do that kind of thing. So, uh, you know, at the Linux Foundation, we've taken a different approach to thinking about how to fund all of the things you need to do to make an open source project work. Um, and that's, that has nothing to do with writing code. So we don't actually pay anyone <laughs> except Linus Torvalds <laughs> and, uh, and, um, and uh, a few of his lieutenants, right? Uh, uh, we actually don't pay anyone to write code. What we do pay for are things like lawyers, right? So to reassure companies that you can use this code, not only do you have to have an open source license, but you need to demonstrate the provenance of the code. Where, the, where did it come from? And was somebody sitting there and watching as submissions were made to make sure that everything followed the, the proper rules about it should come from the people who wrote the code or otherwise have the clearance to make that kind of contribution, right? So that there's never a worry about a submarine patent or, you know, somebody, you know, depending on building their business upon this and then discovering in three years that somebody else actually has rights to that code, right? Um, or marketing, right? Marketing sounds like the last thing that an open source project needs to think about. And yet, uh, you know, people out there in the world need to understand what that project is building. The press always is asking what, what, what goes on. Um, and so having staff focused on getting the word out and doing that in a way that is fair, fair to the developers, fair to the businesses, uh, 
you know, avoiding letting any one business dominate the conversation, um, that's, that's critical and that's part of the Linux Foundation's DNA, right? Um, so, and then finally, you know, when you do have these funders, they kind of need to be, you know, uh, managed, <laughs> um, expectations set, but also very clearly, uh, you know, told the fact that you're writing a check and, and supporting this project doesn't mean you have any special privilege when it comes to the code, right? You don't get veto rights. Your patches don't get priority. If you want to alter the direction of a project, then you have to also contribute in the form of developers right, who are willing to write code, willing to fix bugs, willing to not only throw a big patch over the wall and say, look at this, I've contributed feature X, but to actually engage the rest of the, co of the community in a conversation about whether feature X is the right thing and if this is the right way to build it and, and does this meet quality, all of those kinds of criteria. So long story short, you know, our, the model is bring these companies together. And we have now about 100, uh, in fact, we just crossed 100 um, uh, sponsors of the Hyperledger project. Um, uh, and they are companies like IBM and Intel, banks like JP Morgan, uh, uh, a lot of international organizations too. Um, in fact, of that 100, about 25 are based in mainland China. So I'm going to be spending a lot of time in China the next year. Um, uh, big companies like Huawei, even Chinese startups doing energy blockchain projects, right? Um, this is really exciting and it's a really global effort. And uh, translating that commercial interest into developer momentum is one of our big focuses for the next year. One of the things people are really excited about in the blockchain space is this idea that tokens and using tokens is an entirely new way of funding exactly that sort of plumbing infrastructure. And of course, that's become very popular uh, with, with crowd sales, starting with Ethereum, but, but now many others. And, and the idea here is very much that we can this way also monetize something that before previously wasn't monetizable and, and just fund these projects. Now, it seems to me that what you are proposing, right, or what Hyperledger division you guys have is, is a very different one. Do you feel like what some of those projects do in terms of how they are trying to turn um, these underlying infrastructure protocols almost into corporation-like entities, do you think that's a mistake? It's a good question. So anytime that you turn something into a currency, you can't avoid but introduce two things. Um, government attention, because governments have a lot of uh, opinions about how currencies should work. Um, the more fungible your currency, the more they pay attention. Um, and so that introduces regulation when maybe you don't, don't need it. Um, the second thing is it introduces speculation, right? Um, and, uh, you know, it'd be nice to work on a protocol so, for example, DNS. Would DNS have worked better, uh, or, or email, SMTP, have worked better in the early days if every client had to send a penny when it made a request to a server, right? Um, certainly would have made a lot of DNS servers a lot of money, would have created a business model for running a DNS server, maybe that would have been great. It would have potentially, if we ran it on email, stopped spam because spam was, you know, took advantage of the fact that sending email was zero price, right? Um, and yet, we would have ended up with a very different internet at that point. Um, uh, I think it would have been something that was, uh, um, was even more commercial, um, potentially less uh, free. Um, and, uh, uh, and, and, and when you bring the speculators into it, the speculators themselves are driven to, uh, um, to take advantage of where there's information gaps in, in, a, in a project, right, um, in, a, in an environment. And that, that taking advantage is something that I, I, you know, people who don't think that way like me, you know, I, I, it ends up costing us real money. Their gain is at our loss, right? And so there's a lot of applications out there that I don't think you need to tokenize um, the consensus process around, right? So this is what Bitcoin and Ethereum with mining is all about, right? How do you reward participation in global consensus? And I don't think there's a better way to do it than proof of work, maybe proof of stake. Hopefully Ethereum will figure that out. And, and tokenizing that if your goal is millions or hundreds of millions of nodes, right, that all share a common, a common ledger, right? Um, 
But for a whole lot of the consortium chain applications, you just don't need a token to, cons to incentivize participation in, in consensus, right? If you have 20 banks implementing a, 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 you know, a, a shared ledger to record their transactions, there's inherent incentive there for all of them to participate in that consensus mechanism and provide the, the appropriate resources to do that. Um, just like running a DNS server inherently or running a mail server inherently has so much value, we don't have to tokenize the underlying protocol. Um, so, so, and then finally, uh, you know, so much of the internet was built from pe by, by, by people whose motives was to interconnect and, and enhance the lives of people and, you know, making money, not that it was a secondary thing, um, uh, because we all have to, to have lives, we all pay, have to pay rent, we all have to figure it out. Um, and there's times when I really wish we had a better answer for the publishing world about how to um, reward uh, quality journalism rather than, you know, ad advertising. I think we're, we're at the end of that cycle. As, as the person who put the first ad banner online, um, I've, I've started to feel really guilty about that really recently, right? Um, so I, I, there's some things I look, I think, I think currencies have their role. I think, I think, uh, I'd like to see more of them, uh, uh, more competing currencies actually. Um, but, uh, but as the basis for funding every decentralized application, I'm not into it. And I think there's a lot of people who've stayed out of the, the, the blockchain space because it's been so currency focused. I think if we can, we can help people understand that that's one of a set of applications uh, they'll warm up to it very quickly, and and then we can bring the mainstream of the of the computer science field to us and the mainstream of the application development field. Let's take a break to talk about the Ledger Nano S, the new flagship hardware wallet by Ledger. I'll let Ledger CEO Eric Larchevêque tell you all about how simple the Nano S makes it to securely store all your private keys. The Ledger Nano S is our latest generation hardware wallet. This is a multi-currency hardware wallet. It has a screen and buttons to manage everything on screen. You can generate a new seed, restore a seed, or set up your pin on the device. Your seed will never be exposed to the host computer. On the Nano S, you have different apps. You have the Bitcoin app, you have the Ethereum app, and you have the Fido U2F app for strong authentication, for instance, with Google, Dropbox, or GitHub. You can manage your cryptocurrencies with the Ledger Wallet Bitcoin Chrome app or the Ledger Wallet Ethereum Chrome app. With the Nano S, all your Bitcoin and Ethereum addresses are derived from one unique seed. With one seed, you can have in the same time Bitcoin, Ethereum, Ethereum Classic balances. And also, if you restore your seed, you will also recover all the keys associated to other apps such as Fido U2F, SSH, GPG. So it's very simple, just one seed and multiple applications. The Nano S sets the new standard in hardware wallet security and usability. You can get yours today at ledgerwallet.com. And when you do, be sure to use the offer code Epicenter to get 10% off your first order. We'd like to thank Ledger for their support of Epicenter. When we were talking about how like corporations interact with Hyperledger, one of the things that you pointed out was licensing, right? Like like uh, that Hyperledger and like Linux Foundation broadly, like it focuses on sort of sort of the legal process around software and how software is licensed. So could you explain to us Hyperledger's approach to licensing and what it requires of its participating projects and why that was chosen? Right. So the inbound license for contributions to a Hyperledger project uh, is in the form of the developer certificate of origin, which is very similar to, you've probably also heard of contributor license agreements, right? Both of these are basically um, ways for developers to attest to the fact that the contribution they're making, either they wrote themselves or they have permission to contribute, right? And this is important because um, there's a lot of people who, you know, because they might be naive, will simply import you know, a third-party library into a check-in, you know, and when it turns out that the license on that third-party library was LGPL or something uh, incompatible, or even a wacky, you know, self-declared open source, but not actually technically open source license that says, hey, this is great, except you cannot use this in any government purposes, right? Uh, or you can't use this in commercial purposes, right? 
Um, so all of that, you know, is it, a it's a reminder to developers to to check the licensing, and b it's a reassurance to users downstream not to worry about the the legal integrity of the project. The outbound license is the Apache license, and you know, yes, I have a little bit of um, fondness for it, having uh, played a role in writing it, um, but uh, it was it was designed very carefully to be a license that was as permissive as the original BSD license, right? You know, that Apache started with. It wasn't, the first Apache license was inspired by this, right? Um, uh, but we started to realize, uh, you know, especially as companies were using this code, that there were a number of things that started to, to matter just as much as granting all these freedoms, that you also needed to grant reassurance to all of the users that, um, you know, anybody who had a patent that might read on their original contribution, um, that patent rights also flowed through, right? Um, we also wanted to make it very easy for that license to essentially serve as a contributor license agreement back anytime somebody made a derivative work. Um, uh, and so the Apache license is, is just as free as MIT or BSD, but it has that extra reassurance around patents that, um, you know, we don't have, for example, with um, Satoshi Nakamoto's code. And that's one reason why we were, um, uh, we were somewhat at risk when a certain individual in Australia started angling to uh, convince the world that he was Satoshi Nakamoto. Um, he had a commercial interest in that, which was uh, filing patents with Satoshi's name attached to them on the original Bitcoin uh, concepts. Uh, and then if he had succeeded in convincing the world that he was Satoshi, he would have had a patent right on all implementations out there of, of the Bitcoin protocols, potentially other, any other implementation of proof of work. Um, had Satoshi released his code under the Apache license instead of the MIT license, then we would have had all implicit rights to any of Satoshi's patents, even those that, that had not yet been granted. And this is really important because if you're gonna build an industry on top of a foundation like proof of work, you want to know if, if somebody has, you know, a magic golden ticket to not now, but five years from now or 10 years from now, be able to seek, you know, a penny per transaction or whatever number they wanted from anybody in that system. And so for long as we still have software patents, and hopefully, I don't know, I don't have any optimism about this right now, but it'd be nice to do away with software patents. But as long as we have that, we should view software with that, that is, um, just under a bare MIT or BSD license as potentially having this risk that any of the contributors could one day wake up and say, we have a patent right. And there's never been a court case that's demonstrated that the BSD or MIT licenses have an implicit patent grant as well. They only talk about copyright. So that's one thing to worry about. The other is I just think Apache is more thoughtful when it comes to um, using language that corporate lawyers understand <laughs> uh, and you put the Apache license in front of even the most conservative corporate IP lawyer and they'll go, okay, I understand how this works. I understand its obligations on us as a company. I even understand if we contribute what that means our obligations are and what others can do, right? If you put the GPL in front of them, you know, it's, uh, more and more lawyers are coming to understand what the GPL means and what it doesn't mean and that's good. Uh, but two things are going on. One is, at least in our industry, we're talking to a lot of companies who are still brand new to open source. Maybe not their developers, but their legal departments are brand new. And there's this tremendous learning curve to get them over to where they understand and can get comfortable with the idea that the GPL is not going to be a cancer on their own IP. We all know that it isn't, but right now it still represents you know, many additional months of waiting, at least, some, perhaps, perhaps more, for a legal team to understand and, and accept that in order for somebody at a conservative bank to be able to use, let alone contribute, to an open source project. Secondly, there's a lot of different opinions out there about how to enforce the GPL, um, letting alone the fact that GPL v3 and the AGPL get even stronger, right? So Linus Torvalds famously has, you know, kind of come out against people who have tried to use the GPL as a weapon uh, against companies that have uh, been bundling Linux inside of their their physical objects and their software, right? Um, and I do believe that if you're using the GPL, you should follow its rules and you should release derivative works uh, that you create of that project and things that are tightly linked to it. 
But that boundary of what's linked to that object and what's simply in the same package, that's something that is gray area. And, and that's where you get a lot of differences in enforcement. And all that does is scare away people, scare away companies, scare away potential you know, collaboration uh, partners on a project like Hyperledger. And that's why Apache is really right for us. Um, uh, it's why I, I tend to be um, more religious about this than, than I am about almost any other issue. Um, and, and people understand that once you work, walk them through it. And they understand why, you know, um, an Apache license project can still significantly reward people who build derivatives and add-ons to come to bring their pro their contributions back upstream, right? Um, and and that forking is a risk no matter what license you're under. So uh, I, I we we've been able to make the case, and I and I and all of our projects are, and and that's you know it's 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 a good conversation to have because I think it it puts us whenever you as a project talk about it, it puts everyone on kind of a common understanding of the community dynamic and the kind of project that we want to build going forward. So that's a very, it's a very interesting point. I think it's a point where a few, or it's never a few people in, in the community are really aware of, particularly not uh, some who are not as deep in the development uh, side. But let me just try to rephrase that or, or sort of restate what what the main differentiators are from Apache to GPL. So one is right there with GPL, you have this uh, obligation that if uh, you know, I'm gonna take this GPL project, I'm gonna make some modifications to it, I'm not allowed to you know, make my own proprietary project around that, but I have to contribute that back to the open source uh, side. And of course that might deter some companies from, from doing that in the first place or from, from making changes to it. So that's one thing. And then the other thing you mentioned was that uh, it's less known to corporate lawyers. They're not as comfortable with it. The language is not as clear. Maybe it's not as predictable what would happen in court. Are, are those kind of the main uh, differences? And do you think there are legitimate reasons why uh, a GPL for some of those projects in the blockchain space can still be the right choice? I think you phrased it correctly. Um, uh, I'm, I'm very interested in seeing how quickly can we get to plumbing that we never have to worry about, right? That is ubiquitous, that is standardized, that we can take for granted because it's everywhere and people are updating frequently and you never have to worry about convincing somebody um, about that a long contract is acceptable um, in order for them to get on board with, with, your, with building a chain together, right? Um, and so I, 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 part of this is really my, the goal of seeing, you know, um, these technologies become as ubiquitous as Apache technologies have um, underneath the web. Uh, and, and I think the license has a big part to do with that. Um, I, I, you know, I, I think individuals have respectable reasons for wanting to license their own personal IP under a GPL, they may, you know, be very, they may believe that that's the quid pro quo, is that's why they spend their time is to convince other people to release it back. I also understand the human rights angle. I mean, uh, I used to joke um, 20 years ago that when, you know, Stallman was right, he was just perhaps 40 or 50 years ahead of his time, when there's software in every doorknob and software in every vehicle uh, and there's software in every, everything you, you can do in the world, having the underlying source code of that software is not just a good idea, it's a human right, right? So I'm very sympathetic to that notion. And it's funny how quickly that arrived. It wasn't 50 years, it's 20 years now that there's software in, well, not every doorknob, but I think we're getting close, right? Um, and so the question is one of, more of tactics. Is it the better tactic to say, I'm not going to play with you unless you open source everything you do, well, release as GPL specifically, everything you do? Or is it better to say, I'm willing to give you the fruits of my labor, you know, without compelling you to do anything in return. I am convinced that once you discover how good this is and how productive this process is, you'll turn around and contribute back. And if you don't want to contribute back, I don't want your contributions anyway. It's the carrot versus the stick, right? And I'm very much a carrot kind of guy. And, and I think the people I want to work with, the people I want to collaborate with, should probably be carrot people rather than stick people. Brian, could you, could you walk through the difference between MIT and uh, Apache? And can you also bring MIT and summarize that 
So the MIT and the BSD licenses are very short, right? They, they basically say, here's the software, do whatever you want with it. You know, don't blame us when it breaks. Right? Don't, you can't sue us for it, right? Um, and it, imp- it incorporates software from these other people, right? But um, caveat emptor, right? Uh, and, uh, but here it is, and no obligation back, um, and you, you know, uh, no obligation to, uh, there's nothing in those licenses that requires you to publish your modifications, or you know, uh, can carry the same license forward or anything like that. It does require you to give them credit, you know, to credit to the original authors or anybody else who contributed whenever you redistribute, redistribute it, um, but, uh, but no obligation. Um, and that's nice, uh, uh, but those licenses only appear to cover copyright. They don't appear to cover patent. Um, they also don't say anything about trademark, but that's kind of less of an issue because everybody in the open source community cares about their trademark. I think if you don't care about your trademark, then um, you don't care about kind of defining your community very well. Um, and that's a whole separate issue. Um, uh, MIT and BSD, I like them for their simplicity. They're for people who say, I don't want to think about it. I just want it out there. And if people like it, great. Apache adds some things to that that still fundamentally are that same principle. I want people to use this. I want them to feel comfortable using this. I'm not ever going to come after them for using it, um, but it adds some extra protections for the user in that. It says on a patent basis, nobody that has contributed to this code base will come after you about a patent in this code base, right? Um, It's a little bit longer, but it's so that we have greater clarity around many of these terms and hopefully greater predictability in how it's enforced. So there's a bunch of projects part of Hyperledger at the moment, but I know there have been discussions about some of the Ethereum project, Ethereum clients or EVM uh, implementations joining Hyperledger. What would the implications of that be, uh, especially when it comes to governance as well, since there's been all these governance issues on the network level, like how would Hyperledger function in or be involved in those conversations? So we think of it like, you know, these communities are code communities, right? And they're defined by a mission and they set their own agendas and priorities. And they should be looking at the broader community at Hyperledger when they think about what they're building. And so you could easily see an Ethereum project join that has as a mission, as its, as, you know, uh, uh, as, its, as its statement, as its goal, a scope, um, you know, implementing the Ethereum protocol and uh, being designed to be a high production uh, node on the Ethereum network. But that's not all it, it has to do. I mean, software can do other things, right? So um, there are a lot of people today exploring using Ethereum clients, Ethereum nodes, in um, consortium chain settings. And that's a place where there's other consensus mechanisms that may work better, right? Um, uh, because especially when you don't have to reward mining then and you don't need a currency, then you can't use proof of work. You have to use something else. Um, or proof of stake, uh, even there. Um, But you might still want to have some way to have gas for um, the smart contracts uh, that run inside of the EVM. So so these are still hard questions to answer. And a project that has the freedom to, the software project that has the freedom to explore other consensus mechanisms, other ways to do smart contract engines, and yet still be conformant to the Ethereum standards and participate in the Ethereum network, uh, that's how I would think about a project related to Ethereum hosted at Hyperledger. Um, uh, is th- this really clear relationship, and 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 I think somebody can be a member of both the Ethereum community and the Hyperledger community at the same time. You know, we aren't in conflict. We're not at each other's. You know, we're not we're not trying for different things, right? We all I think want to work towards some common things. Um, so uh, that's. That's how I think of it, and and um, and I think there's been a lot of resonance with that out there, uh, and we'll see we'll see where it goes. I mean, ultimately, as well, I should say, Hyperledger isn't saying that the cryptocurrency world is a bad idea. And while I have my personal concerns about um, coins and currencies, uh, I, there is a spectrum a spectrum from unpermissioned and global and one big chain and tokens, right to you know, consortium chains, highly permissioned, maybe designed for 
five participants, maybe designed for 5,000, right? And there might be room in between there. Um, Sawtooth Lake implements something called proof of elapsed time, which has the, some of the anti, uh, uh, well, some of the Sybil attack protection characteristics of proof of work without having to burn a lot of CPU time, right? Which makes it potentially very easy to have a permission chain, but one where granting permission to join that chain is a very lightweight process. And so we need to explore this spectrum. We have to get out of a dichotomy view of this as purely about, you know, ungo you know ungovernable single computer, you know, single worldwide computer kinds of things, um, or this being about just big banking systems and nothing else. There is a huge spectrum here to explore. Uh, and, and I'd like to see all those different ideas under the Hyperledger umbrella. So, so like, because Hyperledger is this umbrella, we haven't kind of discussed any of the individual projects that are inside the umbrella. And we haven't even named them, but you, uh, in, in the previous answer, we talk, talked about Saw, Sawtooth Lake. And I'm aware of this other project called Fabric. So perhaps could you like, Take a few minutes to just walk us through what projects are there in Hyperledger and what what their speci the specialities of each of them are, just so that we have a rough idea. Sure. So Fabric uh, was the one that perhaps you know uh, really kicked things off uh, and has seen the most collaboration. Um, it is a permission chain DLT um, with uh, written in Go with a smart contract engine that also implements smart contracts in Go, um, using Docker as its container, kind of as its VM, if you want to think of it that way. Um, and uh, I, it was originally started life as a project inside of IBM and then was open sourced. IBM still contributes a substantial amount of the software development activity around it, but it also has contributions uh, and active development from companies like Digital Asset, DTCC, London Stock Exchange, um, Huawei, uh, there are a number of companies and that, that community is growing. Um, our long-term goal is that IBM is just one of many companies uh, um, and is a minority of the, of the contributions. Um, and I think like any young project, sometimes it takes a while to get to uh, a true multi-stakeholder goal like that. Um, Sawtooth Lake has also been a part of the project since day one. Um, it's uh, came, it came from Intel, uh, uh, and it also has seen contributions from, from some other companies and developers. Uh, and it uses an extension inside of Intel's uh, 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 most recent line of chips, something called the SGX extensions, to basically implement uh, something that is kind of the equivalent of proof of works use of burning CPU time as a way to implement a fair consensus and yet it doesn't burn CPU power. Um, it just makes it really hard to bring up you know, more than one node uh, unless you have more than one CPU. Um, so, uh, so, what that, uh, so what that gives you, like I mentioned, is potentially the ability to uh, have larger consortium networks. Um, uh, and it's an interesting project. It's also written in Python. So if you're more familiar with Python, that might be a place to consider starting. Um, there's another DLT that recently joined uh, called Aroha, and it came from some of our Japanese partners. It implements a new consensus mechanism uh, that I wouldn't be able to explain to you, but uses broadcasts in a slightly different way, as I understand it. Um, it's tightly coded C++, so if you're kind of a performance nut, uh, it might be an interesting thing to look at as well. Um, and uh, yeah, it's got a very active community around it. Um, we have a graphical tool called Hyperledger Explorer that basically is a way to look at all these different uh, chains and navigate through and, and look for checksums, that sort of thing, various SDK projects. And then a couple of weeks ago, R3 announced that they'll be releasing um, Corda uh, open source and submitting it as a project at Hyperledger. And so we're working with them on the process for that. Uh, so that it comes in as a as a new project, <clears throat> and over time becomes Hyperledger Corda, ideally with again R three starting out, but hopefully a, a much larger community over time, continuing to improve it, enhance it, add features to it, that sort of thing. Um, and then I'm talking to a bunch of other projects, and nothing to announce yet, but uh, um, I'm really optimistic that it'll show not just you know um, other places on that spectrum that I mentioned, but other uh, parts further up a stack, if you want to think of it that way. Um, uh, that could be really interesting. Excellent. Well, thanks so much, Brian, for, for coming on. I think we've covered a lot here, and it was a great overview of Hyperledger. And I'm sure this is also something we can come back to in the future, both to talk about 
Hyperledger as a, as a sort of an umbrella organization, but then also uh, to do uh, episodes on some of these specific projects because uh, we haven't actually uh, done that in any of them yet, except uh, R3 uh, and Corda, which we did an episode on uh, just a few weeks ago. So yeah, thanks so much. And it's extremely exciting what you guys are building there. And let's uh, hope there it's going to be uh, lots of success for Hyperledger in, in building out the foundation for blockchain technology. Well, thank you, Brian. And thank you, Maher, for allowing me to be here. And thanks so much for our listeners uh, for joining once again. So we are part of the LTB network. So you can find this show and other shows as well on LesterBitcoin.com. And if you like the show, then please uh, leave us an iTunes review. You can do that uh, in any of the iTunes applications. And uh, of course, you can subscribe uh, to the podcast using your podcast application or watch the video on uh, YouTube.com slash Bitcoin. Thanks so much. And we look forward to being back next week. Thank you.